We have introductions. Let's get to them. And we go a little something like this. Hit it. All right, so these aren't the traditional intros of you individually. Frankly, I've run out of things to say about all of you. I mean, there's nothing left I can say about you that hasn't been said. So I'm going with the week in review kind of stuff. Uh, so uh, here we go. Well, here we are with a week left in spring, just six days from summer, with two elections just behind and a big one in front. That's a bummer. When it came to bad voter turnout, we thought Berkeley County was the GOAT. Because in May, a mere 17.8% of the population decided to vote. But then along came the city of Martinsburg elections, and oh my dear, as 6.42% of the population voted to say, hey, Berkeley County, hold my beer. <laughs> Some speculate that the population doesn't vote because they're just too busy. Some say we're just sick of the mudslinging and lies that make us all dizzy. Maybe the general population just needs a good kick in the booty. Or maybe they just won't want to pull a week of jury duty. On the national scene, it's been a month of fun. We've got convictions for Trump and for Joe Biden's son. As Don Corleone once said, how did things get so far? I don't know. If you ask Republicans, it's because of the Biden crime family and their leader, Joe. Fittingly then, crime boss Joseph Robinette Biden Jr. was in Italy with a group of seven allies. And we know this because Republicans shared a video of him aimlessly wandering off on his own to nobody's surprise. However, on this narrative, Republicans are going to have to stick to one plan. Is it that Biden's a mastermind crime boss, or is he a dementia-ridden, doddering old man? It all reminds me of that Gambino crime boss, a real mob vigilante. He wandered the streets of New York in a bathrobe. You remember Vincent the Chin Gigante. Speaking of crimes, just this week the Donald returned to the Capitol Hill mix some three and a half years ago after those hostages committed on January the 6th. Riding back into the Washington, D.C. area looking to avenge like Charles Bronson and kidding Marjorie Taylor Greene about taking out his Johnson. That's Johnson. Holy <laughs> cow. <laughs> That's Johnson, as in Mike, the speaker that Green keeps trying to oust from his recent position as leader, of Speaker of the House. You guys have dirty minds. <laughs> As odd as the scene seemed during the visit from Donald Trump, it got even stranger when Mitch did the McConnell fist bump. Trump promised to return to the old colonial era days of federal revenues with just the tariff tax. I think he even said he'd bring back the bag phone, Blu-rays, VHS, and a Betamax. However, the highlight of his appearance was captured by the Republican throng when they serenaded their president with the happy birthday song. This one fell a little bit flat, though, because when it comes to singing happy birthday to a president, the greatest performance of that song ever is clear and present. There's only one way they could have improved that birthday song show, and that's if they exhumed the body of Marilyn Monroe. Yes, these are interesting times in which we exist when even a presidential endorsement comes with a twist, as we saw yesterday when Trump actually endorsed Larry Hogan, that's right, which marked the first presidential endorsement done entirely out of spite. The mock blessing was immediately rejected as Hogan said this was something I didn't choose. Indeed, consider this an offer from the Don, which I can and will refuse. So just 144 days to go to select a president for me and you, between Trump, who's 78, and Biden, who will be 82. And if those, those, if, if, uh, those ages give you a bit of a scare, take comfort in knowing that at least those two understand Medicare. <laughs> well done. Yep. Understand that you all have dirty minds, and on that <laughs> premise, we begin with issue number one and Joseph Joey Torts Ferretti. Rob, uh, people close to me have told me that I've been too negative lately with some of my topic selections and discussions I have raised. So I am going to go with more of a uh, uh, lighthearted uh, topic today. And, and, and really, it's in honor of Jerry West, who uh, undoubtedly is the icon of icons in West Virginia, not only in athletics, but uh, I think in life in general. Uh, and I think everybody's familiar with his life story, of course. And, and I, it got me thinking, who is on the Mount Rushmore of West Virginia athletics? Uh, and, and that includes people, of course, who played the sport, but also people who coached, uh, and, and for good reason, uh, to, there's, to expand that topic a little bit. Uh, so uh, 
I think without saying much, Jerry West is the clear number one when it comes to Mount Rushmore in West Virginia. Number two uh, is Nick Saban. And I'm going to just say a very short uh, synopsis of his career. He is the number one college football coach of all time, period. Uh, winning national championships at two different universities, also coaching at Michigan State and the Miami Dolphins and the NFL. Uh, all successful stints, but unparalleled at what he's done at Alabama. Number three in the Mount Rushmore is Randy Moss who I think is widely considered to be the number two NFL wide receiver of all time after Jerry Rice, statistically, but many people consider him to be the most talented wide receiver to ever lace up a pair of spikes. Uh, He was a legend in high school. Lou Holtz called him the greatest high school football player he's ever seen. Bobby Bowden compared him to Deion Sanders athletically, and he said that he'd never thought he'd make that comparison. Uh, Randy at Marshall University with Chad Pennington together combined to almost beat WVU at Morgantown in Morgantown at Mountaineer Field in a much ballyhooed matchup. He was in the top three Heisman votes uh, with Peyton Manning and the winner Charles Woodson out of Marshall University. So think about that. Went on to the NFL where he had a great career, first ballot Hall of Famer. He's my number three. Lastly, I struggled with this one because I know we have gold medal winners in West Virginia and we've got uh, legends like Sam Huff and Al Greer. But I'm going with a guy that I think, and this might uh, be music to Mike Height's ears, I'm going with Chuck Howley, a 15-year NFL linebacker, 13 of those years with the Dallas Cowboys. He's drafted seventh in the NFL draft by the Chicago Bears, hurts his knee in his second year, retires from the NFL to work at a gas station in Morgantown. Comes back to the NFL, becomes part of the doomsday defense in Dallas, plays in two Super Bowls, wins one of them, is the only NFL player in history to be an MVP on a losing NFL team in the Super Bowl wins the Super Bowl the next year. At WVU, he lettered in five different sports, football, track, wrestling, gymnastics, and diving. He was all conference in football and diving, winning the one-meter diving championship in the Southern Conference. He was elected to the Hall of Fame recently. I think that is an unparalleled collegiate and NFL career when I think about uh, folks – who came from West Virginia. So Chuck Holly is my fourth on the Mount Rushmore of West Virginia athletics. I, I, I solicited information from Mike Carl very quickly because uh, I, I know he follows West Virginia sports for, forever. And his selections were Jerry West, Sam Huff, Hot Rod Hunley, which I think is very debatable. And then this fourth guy, Ron Fritz Williams, who, frankly, I don't know. <laughs> I couldn't find much about. Uh, but those were my Carl's selections uh, to get the topic uh, discussion going here this morning. But mine, I think, are unquestioned, at least the first three. West, Saban, Randy Moss, and the fourth, Chuck Holly. I'm interested in what others have to say. I assume this is like the men version of Mount Rushmore because Mount Rushmore has four men on it. If you, if you were doing oh, no, a female no, no. version of Mount Rushmore, that would be different? Or are you including women in this? Because it's oh, tough no, to ignore no, Vicki Bullitt, I, I, too. I, I, oh, I consider Vicki Bullitt, uh, Mary Lou Retton. Um, you know, we, we've had some great female athletes, too, come from West Virginia. But I, I thought for sustained excellence, Hall of Fame, careers, uh, I, I looked at folks like that. And, and uh, I, I just thought Chuck Holly measured up when I looked at the, uh, the stats on him. All right, Larry Schultz. Yeah, I would uh, not go with Nick Saban. He certainly did great things at Alabama. Um, (laughs) And, you know, just growing up in Fairmont isn't enough for me. Uh, If you're going to be in the West Virginia Hall of Fame, you got to be a West Virginian. Um, Are you saying you've had to have done it in West Virginia? Well, at least a part of it. Um, I mean, at least something. Uh, right. so who, who's your four? 
So I would go uh, instead of Saban. I, I agree that uh, Randy Moss and and Chuck Holly. I would add Mary Lou Retton. Um, she um, stunned the entire world. Sure, it wasn't a long term thing, but you know gymnastics, women's gymnastics in the Olympics seldom is. You don't have very many people who go back every four years. Um, but she stunned the entire nation, and everybody. Nobody found out where Fairmont was by hearing about Nick Saban. They found out where Fairmont was by hearing about Mary Lou Retton. So she would be my choice. Otherwise, I agree with Joe. But by your logic, she didn't do the Olympics in West Virginia, and it was a short-term, one kind of a week event. So how does that apply? Well, it applies because, uh, like I say, she seemingly came from nowhere. Um, No one had ever heard of her, and she wasn't famous or well-known but she um she just wowed the entire world uh in in this thing and you know she's also done the things as a private citizen since that would um also uh certainly not disqualify her from this sort of recognition so yeah i would leave nick saban out and put mary lou retton in otherwise i agree with joe mr height larry Larry, do you Good, good, Joe. Let, 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 let me just say, Larry, the only only pushback I would give you on, on Mary Lou Retton was that in the Olympics where she won the gold medal, the Soviet bloc, Eastern German, East Germans, and the and the Soviets did not compete. Remember, they were they were boycotting because of what we did in 1980, and so and of course at that time Russian gymnastics was at the top. And so while it's certainly not her fault, I mean, she beat everybody that she was there and competing. Uh, it was just tainted a little bit because the, the Russians weren't there to compete against her. Well, it could be that they didn't show up because they knew she was going to win. <laughs> <laughs> could have been that Afghanistan thing. I don't know. <laughs> and, and by the way, you're welcome to post your four in our comment section on Facebook. And uh, Mr. Height, you're up. Well, I... I Took a little. I'm going to admit, first of all, that when I first read this, um, Joe, I didn't see the athlete part. So I went with a West Virginia Mount Rushmore of West Virginians, and then I saw the athlete okay. part second. So I'm going to give you two of them, um, and obviously Jerry West, and I did have Mary Lou written, and and I had Mary Lou written um, not because of the longevity or anything, but because of the impact she made not just on the state of West Virginia, but the the impact she made on the nation um, and, and how it was. She became an instant superstar in the United States, um, and she did put West Virginia and Fairmont on the map at that point. And, and she was a, the darling for, for some period of time. So I did put her on there. Uh, Randy Moss, obviously uh, a superstar. And then my, my last one was Hack Wilson, uh, you know, a Martinsburg guy who, who still yeah. holds the, the RBI record in baseball, um, may n- never be touched. Um, this guy was, was huge in his day in baseball. So um, those were my top four uh, in, in, uh, in the athlete section. Now, I, I had another Mount Rushmore of just West Virginians, and believe it or not, there are no athletes on this list. <laughs> um, and, and in no particular order, my, my top were Booker T. Washington, Katherine Johnson, Chuck Yeager, and William General William Westmoreland. So those were my top Rushmore, uh, uh, Mount Rushmore West Virginians. Mm, interesting. Mr. Stubblefield. Yeah, that's interesting. I did not go uh, the non uh, um And, Joe, your list is pretty inclusive uh, with the ones that's added. I'd add a couple of so names that have not been mentioned, and one, Gabe Catlett and Bob Huggins. Uh, they uh, they may not compare to Jerry West, but they each had a quite a pronounced uh, uh, impact. And also, and you got to help me with a name, I'm growing blank, the, the baseball coach in Jefferson County that's been there. John Lowry. Oh, John, John Lowry, Lowry yeah. yeah. And uh, in many ways, he's, uh, he's he deserves to be, uh, uh, maybe we need to have a slightly lower 
Mount Rushmore number two. And then Vicki Bullitt. Uh, not only did she uh, uh, have a uh, sterling basketball career, but since then she's handled herself with great dignity. Uh, Vicki is one of those people you just have to be proud of that she's from West Virginia or Martinsburg. She's a gold medalist. Mary Lou Retton's a gold yeah, medalist. Yeah. James Jett is a gold medalist yes. out of West Virginia as well as he was – uh, an alternate on the 4x100 relay mm-hmm. team. He ran uh, some of the qualifying races in, Qua- in Carl Lewis's stead while he was out competing and trying to win his four golds in different events. James Jett did, did those uh, uh, preliminary races, so he also earned a gold medal. Mr. Gilstrap. <clears throat> um, I don't know if the audience knows this, but in the night before these sessions, we share what these topics are going to be. <laughs> and, and as we all know, sports ball is my life. So I... <laughs> I won't share specifically what my response was to this question, but it's it's not. It was six lettered. Oh, <laughs> oh, were the first two. <laughs> and um, but I did. I thought, okay, I can do this. So I decided to go and, and do do some research um, because I haven't. Okay, I recognize the names, like like I've heard the names. I have no idea who these people are. So I did. You've left off your list, Jerry Tennant, who still is. He holds the he. He and and his driver, uh, he's from uh, Princeton, West Virginia. He and his driver Gary Sheffield still are the highest scoring, the uh, the highest medalists in bobsled, two and four man bobsled from their record in 1961. Wow! They're completely left off of your list, and, and I th- I think that's shameful. I well, feel chagrined. Gold, gold you know, medal. you've been scolded by Gilstrap for yeah. You've been scolded. <laughs> now, and and kind of on a more serious note, he'll probably I, kill you off in his next book. <laughs> I, I, you know, Olympians in West Virginia. So just kind of doing this Google search, and I ended up on uh, the a WVU Olympian site. Forty-eight percent of WVU Olympians were in what sport? Shooting rifle. Shooting yeah, rifle. Yeah, Absolutely. Yeah, 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 yeah. So then I thought, all right, let's do a little bit more research. Was that biathlon? I, I don't know. Just yeah, shooting. Biathlon. Just, just, just shooting and skiing. Right. No, it's not biathlon. Just shooting. 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 Yeah. So. I did a little bit more research. So true to form, Medal of Honor winners from West Virginia, 11 in World War II, four in Korea, and nine from Vietnam. So we are, we're, we're good at, at finding things and, and shooting them, I guess. And so, <laughs> <laughs> so that was it. That's the best I could do. You're not going to go to the murder rate next, are you? No, <laughs> no, I'm not. But I, I really do appreciate y'all leaning into my strengths on these things. So, so you have uh, no Mount Rushmore is what you're saying? I have, I have no, no, I don't. <laughs> I don't, but I tell you, it's, it's next a week, <laughs> next time on here, we will, argue, lane. we will argue parts of speech, okay? We, we'll, <laughs> I, would like to get into, I would like to get into the dangling participle, please. I bet you would. <laughs> yeah. The Oxford Code. You know, the, uh, Rob, the only other name that uh, I, I think probably deserves mentioning is a fellow named Randy Barnes, mm-hmm. who is a shot putter, won the gold medal. In the 1996 Olympics, and he still has an Olympic and world record in one of the disciplines in shot putting. Uh, He was the man uh, in that track and field event back in the 90s, and um, uh, he deserves mentioning. No one mentioned John Cruck from Romney, Mm -hmm. who uh, is a lifetime 300 hitter, uh, also won a world championship with the Philadelphia Phillies. Uh, and was a bit of a high school legend over in, in Hampshire County. Uh, and then I think uh, w- I, Hal Greer, of course, averaged almost 20 points a game in the NBA for a, a very long time, uh, well-known West Virginian. And uh, interesting thing about Hack Wilson, uh, Mike is right. I mean, he had 191 RBIs in 1930. It's a record that still stands. He also hit 56 home runs which was more than Babe Ruth. And that was a record that stood until uh, uh, Roger Maris hit 61 or 60. Well, I can't remember the number. Maris so, hit 61, uh, Babe Ruth hit 60 and 59. Yeah. but uh, And that was in the dead ball era uh, that Hack Wilson hit 56 home runs. So uh, clearly uh, a baseball legend. Um, and, and I'm sure Gary Gefford would be upset if we didn't mention him. But th- those are uh, uh, 
uh, I think we covered pretty much the most prominent people in West Virginia athletics, but it, it goes with a little bit of sadness that Jerry West passed because uh, not only the logo of the NBA, but uh, just an ambassador for the state of West Virginia, uh, what he accomplished not only on the court, but as a general manager of the Lakers, winning championship after championship, putting together some of the most iconic teams ever in the NBA as an executive with that organization. And then he went on to other organizations and cleaned them up from an executive standpoint. Uh, just a wonderful uh, life and career that uh, I'm sure all West Virginians uh, feel the need to celebrate. Yeah, and you know, when you do Mount Rushmore's, the, these are fun things to discuss. There's obviously no right answer for them one way or the other. But it's interesting as to what criteria fits. Like Larry brought up the point about Nick Saban not doing it in West Virginia. He just grew up in West Virginia, and that's pretty much it. And, and it's an interesting discussion topic as part of how you select your Mount Rushmore. Did the person have to have their success in West Virginia? How did they contribute after they retired from what they did? Uh, did they contribute specifically to West Virginia, or was the credit simply the way they lived their life and it reflected well on, on where they came from? Uh, their athletic accomplishments or coaching accomplishments or whatever, how much of it took place in West Virginia. Like I could, I could give you an argument about if you wanted to talk about people who, who did it in West Virginia, you could make a case that, that major Harris has, has as great of an influence on the success of West Virginia football as anybody in the last 30 or 40 years, right? Before there was a oh, national yeah. championship yeah. game, major Harris actually got his team to a national championship game. And had he not been injured, who knows? They may have won that game, and that would have been the, the national championship. Uh, I, I could put Sam Huff in a second on that on the Mount Rushmore of, of all-time athletes because he did it at West Virginia. He did it in the NFL. He did it for a couple of different teams. He, he's a, I believe he's in the College Football Hall of Fame and the National Football uh, uh, Professional Football Hall of Fame. There's no actual NFL Hall of Fame. It's Professional Football Hall of Fame. You can make that case easily. Randy Moss, to this day... And I'm 61, and I, I coach high school football, and I've been around high school football since I was 9 or 10 years old. He's still the only high school athlete I've ever seen who could have walked off the high school football field and the next day walked into an NFL locker room and played. Yeah. I, I've never seen anybody like him at the high school level at any position, and, and I, I probably never will. He was that much of an athletic freak as a high school kid and probably is one of those few – people who could have made it in the NBA or the NFL. Yeah, and you, you mentioned the NBA. The one we haven't mentioned is a Jason Williams, who was a phenom when, with, with Randy Moss um, at, yeah, at that time. I thought of him yesterday, yeah. Yeah. right? Yeah. Go on YouTube. Do yourself a favor and go on YouTube and look up the elbow pass from Jason Williams. Oh, that guy was phenomenal. <laughs> yeah. right? I, I mean, who, who can complete a pass using their elbow? Jason Williams could, and he could do it accurately on a fast break, yeah. running 20 miles an hour. <laughs> Come on, who does that? Rob, Rob, wasn't it the Martinsburg team, basketball team in 1994, coached by Dave Rogers, that beat DuPont and Randy Moss and Jason Williams? Yep. And Bobby and Howard. Yep. Yeah. yeah. I mean, a phenomenal high school basketball team in Martinsburg ends up beating it. Yeah, and uh, our one of our listeners, uh, Damon Wright, his older brother Solomon, I think it's his older brother, uh, older or younger, uh, Solomon Wright was on uh, that team. Richie Sutherland was on that team. Uh, there was uh, Aubrey Gray was a man child uh, on that mm -hmm. team. Marcus Logan, uh, I think uh, Kirk Grantham was the point guard on that team, if I remember. There was just a phenomenal group of kids who went down there, and no one gave them the chance to win that game. Yeah. Somehow they won it, yeah. right? Uh, so anyway, that's a fun topic to start the show with, Joe. Good job. Okay. Admiral, you're on the clock. Good morning. That break w went flawlessly. <laughs> <laughs> because it was the appropriate length. Uh, also, Mr. Lawrence Schultz. Larry. Yep. Glad to be here. New York Times bestselling author John Gilstrap. Good morning. The Sarge Delegate Michael Heights. Good morning. Great to be here. And with issue number two, the Admiral Bill Stubblefield. I'm going to drift away from kind of the lighthearted discussion that Joe introduced and look at uh, a poll that re that was released this past week uh, it, by Captain Kaplan Strategies, which is a well-known, well-recognized uh, polling group. They showed that of uh, the candidates for governor, Marcy has 34%, Manchin 26%, 
Williams, 21%, 18% uncertain. What's, I, I do not understand this poll. I don't understand what's the mechanics behind it. Uh, this is a for a general election, not for a primary election. Marcy got 34% throughout the primary. He's coming up with a poll for the general election, and he's still stuck at 34%. And you look at the two Democratic candidates in what is known as a red state. The two Democratic candidates together is 40, 47, 48%. And then you have an uncertainty of around 18%. Uh, and uh, So uh, my question is, what does this poll mean? What uh, does it show that Marsh is in real trouble? Does it show that we're shifting, and I'm saying this in, in jest, that we're shifting from a red state back to a blue state? What does it mean? Yeah, and put this in context, 40% of the state's registered voters are Republicans, 30% are Democrats, and in that poll, the Republican nominee got 34% to put this all in context. That's right, yes, sir. Delegate Michael Height, let's go with you first. Yeah, I'm not surprised by this. Um, you say are, we're a red state. Are we shifting back blue? I, I don't think so. No, I, I said that in jest. Mike. Right, sure. Yeah. Uh, and and the reason I say that is because we were for the longest time a blue state. And I think that um, I've said this before. I think that the Democratic Party has moved farther left than people in West Virginia were comfortable with, particularly a lot of the Democrats who were middle-of-the-road Democrats to begin with, and that's why they've switched to either independent or to Republican. So, uh, you know, you look at, at Morsi is, is holding on to all of the Republicans, I would say, um, and uh, a handful of Democrats. But I also think that when you when you throw Manchin in the mix, who is that, that middle-of-the-road um, old West Virginia Democrat that people still like, um, him and his policies, um, I, I think you, he's peeled off a lot of the independents and maybe a, a few Democrats and, and Republicans here and there. Um, and, and that's the reason that the poll is, is coming out the way it is. And then you have Steve Williams, who's still holding on to the, the far left or the further left uh, Democrats. Um, so I, I didn't see this poll is very surprising at all. Um, but the interesting thing about the poll is I don't think Manchin's mentioned that, uh, that he's running yet. Um, so, you know, this poll is, uh, is speculative um, at best. Um, and, and maybe, I, I think I said this last week, I think maybe gives um, Manchin um, some insight into whether or not he is going to run. Um, if he can peel off that many without announcing that he's running if he actually makes the announcement will he peel off more and can he can he pull more and more democrats from steve williams if if the democrats feel like steve can't win um will he pull off more votes there and give manchin a real shot larry schultz yeah the, the, it, it i think the poll about describes what i expected um, if you told me Joe Manchin was getting in this race and asked me to guess what the polling would look like five months before the election, uh, yeah. Um, and so, I, I mean, I don't think that uh, Mr. Morrissey is a charming or, or a particularly um, charismatic candidate. So it's not like everybody loves the guy and they can't wait for him to run for governor. I, I'm not being critical here. I'm just saying he's not all that well known. Um, he, he, uh, unlike uh, Mr. Saban and uh, Mary Lou Retton, he didn't grow up in West Virginia. He doesn't bring that uh, thing that uh, Manchin seems to bring of being an old time West Virginia Democrat. And so yeah, I'm not that surprised by this. I am interested to see whether there's some sort of workout that can be done between uh, Steve Williams and, and Manchin so as not to split the opposition to, um, to Mr. Morrissey. Um, it would be fascinating to have um, an accomplished public servant like uh, Steve Williams, who's done a great job, as I understand it, 
helping Huntington get past the opioid crisis um, and and deal with that very serious set of problems they have down there. Um, it would be interesting to see if there is a way that they can. I mean, maybe what Manchin will do is wait until uh, August or just before the deadline and say, no, I'm not going to run. I'm supporting Mr. Williams. That will be very interesting. Can Joe Manchin push those votes uh, to Steve Williams and put him in the lead? That would be fascinating. Um, and maybe that's maybe that's the plan. Mr. Gilstrap. <clears throat> West Virginia, historically, for generations, has been blue. And it, it shifted red as, as the liberal policies just went far too left for the comfort zone. Uh, that doesn't mean, I don't think, that the, the democratic tendencies of West Virginians have necessarily changed all that much. It's just they didn't want to follow that far left. My concern is, as the what we've seen in, in most recent elections, is the Republicans go farther and farther right. I think the 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 average West Virginian is starting to get uncomfortable, and in comes Joe Manchin, who or not. You know, I think I, he's the wild card. He's just kind of playing this this am I or or an I sort of role, and I think that that is reflected in this in this poll. Um, the, the people who are uncomfortable or not entirely comfortable with the, the rightward, far rightward indications of the Republican Party, I, I think they're saying, well, you know, Manchin's really not that hardcore left-wing guy. He's kind of a, a reasonable fellow. He was an okay governor while he was here. So, you know, maybe, maybe that's the one we, we want to have. If he doesn't run, then you know you take those numbers out, and of course now you got are are those mostly Republican numbers? Are they mostly Democrat numbers? I'm going to guess that they're mostly Republican numbers. Um, Steve Williams, you know he's I think a hardcore Democrat, a hard anyone who declares themselves to be a Democrat. And Manchin played this really well. He, he declared himself now to be an independent, so he's really playing this cloaking game. Um, I think it's hard now with the Democrat National Democratic Party being so far to the left, pandering so far to the left. Uh, and while William says that he's he's a moderate, I think it's really hard to escape the 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 being painted with the National Democratic Party brush. So I don't I don't think he can get elected as as governor. Um, but you know, Manchin is the wild card. He, he who knows as it stands now. The, your question, Bill does do the, does the poll surprise me? No, not really. Um, the independence, I don't understand. The independence just kind of in the middle, not deciding one way or the other. It's just my, my mind doesn't work that way. But Manchin has, has really, I don't understand the game he's playing, but I, I, I think the indecision is what he's inserted into, into the politics. When, when does he have to actually make a decision? When does he have to call the ball? Early August. Okay. Oh, really? That long? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Joe Ferretti. Well, West Virginia... Uh, as I have learned over the years, is, is a provincial state. Um, you know, we, we like to tout those who were born and bred in West Virginia. And, and you know, they're one of us. And uh, I moved to West Virginia 20 years before Patrick Morrissey did. And I'm considered a transplant. So, uh, you know, it takes a long time, I think, to put together political connections and support uh, to get to know folks in this state. It, it, it's a rural state. It's hard to, to traverse when you're in the car. Uh, it takes a long time to establish yourself. And while he's been an attorney general and has been, uh, you know, front and center in terms of West Virginia politics and, and in the West Virginia legal system, he still has only been here since 2006. So through no fault of his own, I think it just it takes a long time to develop a network. And, and when you compare him to Joe Manchin, there is no comparison uh, for someone like Joe who's in his mid-70s and has been here forever. So uh, I, I think there's always going to, in, in the comparison, Morrissey's going to pale in comparison to others of the ilk like Joe Manchin. The interesting part of this poll, Bill, which I think supports your thesis here about, you know, uh, Morrissey's inability to consolidate support was in that same poll. 
Jim Justice polled at over 60 percent from the same people who were polled and gave uh, 34 percent to Morrissey. That kind of underperformance has to concern the Republicans a little bit, because while we are a deep red state, in terms of how we have elected our governors in the past, we have gone against the grain. Uh, I can show you when we were deep blue and Republicans won the governor's seat. So uh, it's an interesting dynamic here. I, I don't know long term if Manchin's going to have any role in this election or not. But uh, I think the only signal you can get from the, the recent polling that you cite, Bill, is that Morsi still has work to do uh, if he wants to uh, win this governor's seat. You know, yeah. the other part of, of Bill's question was, um, is Morsi in trouble? And, That's, and, that was the central right. part of my and, question. And yeah. I don't I would say I don't think so, because in a three way race right now, he's leading, even though he's he doesn't. Um, he doesn't have what you would consider an overwhelming lead, but he still has a, a significant lead over Manchin. In a two-way race, I don't think it's a race at all. I think Williams loses bad, and, and Morrissey is, is the clear winner. So the only way that he's in trouble is if Manchin actually gets into it. And right now, looking at the polls, he's leading Manchin by a, a substantial mar yeah, margin. You're right there, Mike, but the, and I— Obviously, was not very clear in the point I wanted to make. Uh, there are pro you made the comment that this poll indicates suggests that Marsh is holding on the Republicans and stripping a few of the Democrats or independents away. I see this as just the opposite with this poll. When we have something like 40 or 41 percent, 42 percent of the registered voters in the state as being Republicans, and Marsh is only getting. 34 percent in total that means he's losing six or seven or eight percent of the other republicans and that to me would be the frightening part if i was marcy the frightening part of this poll. but aren't some people still stung by the fact that their candidate didn't win the primary john i think you're exactly right and so i don't know if that's what's reflecting here or not i think there's some other dynamics to here and i I yield to you, Mike Height, that it's a uh, that this is reflecting three as opposed to two. Everything changes when we get if there's just two. Understand? But the central, my central point was that Marsh is underperforming the number of Republicans in the state, at least in this poll. Well, and I wonder how many of those Republicans are recent Republicans that have flipped that that, that move from the either independent or Democrat to the Republican Party and yeah. are still down middle of the road. Yeah. Yeah. And Morsi may be too far right for yeah. them and and they see mansion is more in their line yeah and there's some of what john gilscrap i think said as well there's right. still some smarting of the others because the the primary race was a pretty down and dirty race yes and uh and even though patrick marcy says he did not do mudslinging his pack did a lot of mudslinging and so there may be some repercussion of that but i think it's an interesting there's an embedded question in here that's very, very interesting. We have yet to answer. So. On to issue, go ahead, Larry. To what Joe Ferretti said, just very quickly, um, I have a poster of A. James Manchin standing in a, in a junkyard uh, with his hand <laughs> on a bringer washer, and it says, let us purge our proud peaks of these jumbled jungles of junkery. <laughs> and it's signed by A. James Manchin. Um, it's got a place of honor in my basement on the wall. In the uh, uh, and so it, it, there's nothing like that for Patrick Morrissey. There's no there's no poster of his uncle uh, as a West Virginia office holder. And and you know th that can play. That sort of thing can play. Well, Kathy Cloud on our Facebook page said, "In West Virginia, people vote for people, not party, uh, especially when it comes to governor." Uh, issue number three, Mr. Heights. Um, I'm going to go to, to city politics. Um, who cares? <laughs> and, and was, was yes, the answer is 6.42% of the people. Right. And, and who cares? Was that the message that the Martinsburg residents sent out on Tuesday by their turnout, uh, their dismal turnout in the polls that they just don't care? All right. Was that the message sent out? John Gilstrap. You know, I, 
do you want to see the glass half full or half empty? I, you could argue, if if I were just elected with very few votes, I would say, and I'm an incumbent, I would say, wow, what a great job I have been doing these last few years. People are so satisfied. They see no reason to go out and cast a vote one way or the other. They're just, people only vote when they're angry. People don't vote when, when, they're, when everything is going well. So I see nothing but positivity out of it. Um, I'm not sure that's true, but but that's how I would. That's what what I would tell myself. I think apathy is is a huge problem, I, and I can't speak for city politics. I don't know what the city politics are, but I don't think we can hang our hat on 17 percent in Berkeley County. Um, it, it's I don't understand the ap voter apathy. I, I think a lot of it is exhaustion. You know, having just gone through the the primaries and and okay, no, I can't do this again. I'm not doing another. I'm not going to do another election. I think that's part of it. But I don't know. It, it's, it, it's discouraging. William? I cannot buy the exhaustion point because we look right across the county line, a town 15, 16 miles away from us, Shepherdstown. They had election the few days before Martinsburg did, 48, 49% people turnout. Uh, below 50%, but it's a far cry above our 4.6, whatever 6. it was. 6.4. 6.4. So uh, what makes the difference between Martinsburg and Shepherdstown? Uh, I don't know. Uh, I found the race, uh, Mike, uh, there were some surprises. Uh, this is not your question, uh, but it, it's kind of a subset of your question. Uh, I found I was surprised that Elaine Malk did not do better than what she did. She finished fourth. Uh, she has a reputation of uh, of winning elections. Now, when she got in a crosshairs with the uh, with uh, Julie Small, uh, that's and she lost the court case or was uh, was. Uh, uh, convicted by the grand jury, uh, that had something to do with it. Uh, that was the first race she's lost. She still has a phenomenal popularity, though, especially in the Hedgesville area. If this election had been in Hedgesville, it would have been different. But that's, that's one thing I found surprising in the Martinsburg race. And to clean up the legalese, they're indicted by the grand jury. Indicted. I, I, yeah. yes. Mr. Schultz, yeah. can you can correct yeah, us all you. on that yeah. one if you want? Yeah, yeah the, um, the thing that occurs to me is that it's the timing of the election right after this big exhausting primary that drove the low turnout. In other words, uh, it just didn't make the radar screen. If, if I were interested in, in having more people in the city vote in my elections, I would find a way to have that election on the same day as the other ones. People sort of... But what about Shepherdstown? Well, the situation's um, exactly the same in Shepherdstown. Uh, Shepherdstown uh, is a little different in terms of the sort of notions of who, for example, Shepherdstown, uh, I think you would find, is quite a democratic uh, stronghold uh, to the extent there is such a thing in anywhere Relatively in West speaking, Virginia. For sure. yeah. yeah. And, and so that's a different deal. Um, those folks are really interested not so much in the madness that's going on in the Jefferson County Courthouse with the county commission stuff, but saying, okay, we got a, we got a, a, a town council election here and a mayor election, and we can press through and get some people that we won't have to read the newspaper every day to see if they've been indicted <laughs> so, or, or, or thrown out of office for some reason. So I, I think that is just uh, different. Uh, in that sense. Well, and the demographics of Shepherdstown are much different. It, there, there's not generational growth and, and families in Shepherdstown like there are in Martinsburg, um, where you've lived there forever. A lot of people in Shepherdstown have moved in from other areas um, to the, the city itself in, internally. It would be interesting to know what the vote in Shepherdstown was in the primary. You might find that it was even lower in Shepherdstown than it was for their local, um, their their city, their town election. Right. In other words, because people are new, like who who's Donald, who's Charles Trump, who's Craig Blair? I don't I don't know any of these people. And uh, then they sort of look around and say, I, Yeah, well, I don't. I know, do know the yeah. the mayor and the town council. Well, let's go to Joe Ferretti before we run out of time in the segment. Joe. Yeah, Mike. When you when you talked or introduced the subject, the thought that came to my mind was. 
you know, in some respects, and I hate to do this because I know some of these people as friends and acquaintances, but in, in some respects, the candidates themselves failed to really whip up any enthusiasm. Uh, they, you know, we know that, that many were hesitant to come on the radio and discuss the issues. Uh, debates were uh, certainly not going to happen. And even the election nearing they did was low key. I mean, it consisted primarily of having a Facebook page and yard signs. And I, I so what were the issues in the city election that these folks uh, were, were bringing front and center? And, and I, I'm hard pressed to, to think what they were. So in some respects, the candidates themselves bear some of the responsibility here for the low turnout, I believe. They just didn't whip up the enthusiasm. And, and that's how you end up with out of 19,000 residents, you have 1,100 votes. I mean, that's just, that's paltry. Uh, so I, I hate to do it, but uh, I, I think you have to uh, also critically examine the kind of uh, election that was run, run. Well, Martinsburg historically has poor voter turnout. Uh, not 6% poor, but I was stunned to learn years ago when I began working in the area and had to cover elections that 8 to 10% was the norm for a city of Martinsburg election. 6% is obviously even worse, but it's never been a hotbed for people turning out to vote, uh, at least not recently. Uh, anyway, Bill, final thought comes back to you on this. Or sorry, Mike, I final thought comes back to you. Yeah, you know, I see what you're saying, Joe, but I, I, I guess because we're political junkies and we look at it a little bit different, you know, I, the, 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 the absolute apathy towards voting in Martinsburg and in Berkeley County this past time, I, I think is appalling. You know, most of us look at it as a, a duty of ours to go and vote. So when you see 6% turnout or you see 10% turnout in the teens, it's, it's just very disappointing to those of us who follow politics on a regular basis and see how politics can influence our lives every day and how important it is to get who we feel are the right people in place. So I, I was just very disappointed um, in, in the turnout of Martinsburg. Yeah, in regards to Joe's point, uh, I think uh, I disagree with Joe on this one. I don't think it's anybody's fault but yours when you don't vote. Yeah, it's not the politicians' fault. It's not the enthusiasm's fault. It's not the energy or the issues' fault. You have a right to vote. If you choose to not exercise it, that's on you, and it's on nobody else. Now, you know, if you can't get to the polls that day, something happened. Those are reasons. But ninety-three percent of the people out there, point ninety-three point six percent of the people, I'm sure, did not all have valid reasons why they couldn't vote on the city of uh, Martinsburg's election day. On that note, we take our break here. And when we come back, Mr. Schultz, uh, you are on the clock here for, uh, what is it, issue number four when we return. Now, you may be wondering why I'm playing the Flintstones theme. <laughs> To open up this segment, it was on this date in 1977 that Alan Reed died. He was the voice of Fred Flintstone. And when I was putting together the uh, open today, I was trying to think of something I could rhyme with Mifepristone uh, <laughs> in order to get Bill to say it. And the only thing I could think of was Fred Flintstone, but I thought I'd uh, save it uh, for now. Close, yeah. But, yeah, so, Bill, thank you, John. Bill, if you don't mind, would you mind saying? <laughs> Fred Flintstone? I can do that. <laughs> well played. <laughs> that was beautiful. All right, now with issue number four, Mr. Larry Schultz. Yeah, it's a, it's a simple question. Will Joe Biden pardon his son, Hunter? And uh, as an aside, uh, in a similar situation, does anyone doubt that Donald Trump would pardon his son? All right, let's start with you, Joe Ferretti, via telephone. Well, he has announced that he will not pardon Hunter Biden. He will not commute his sentence, which is another matter uh, or option available. Um, uh, it remains to be seen if he loses in November, and he's a lame duck president, whether uh, he attempts to pull a rabbit out of the hat for his son in the uh, – last two months of his presidency so uh, i'm a wait and see guy on that one and i think it might be dependent on the election results 
All right, Mr. Height. Um, so I don't think he will pardon his son, but I do think he will commute the sentence. And he has said he wouldn't pardon him, but he has not definitely said he wouldn't commute the sentence. So I don't, I don't foresee, no matter what the sentencing is, I don't see Hunter Biding spending any time in jail uh, because I think he will commute the sentence. Um, and I'm sort of wondering, does anybody know when the, the, the when they're coming back to yeah. say when? Yeah, excuse me. I thought Biden said yesterday he would not commute the sentence. No, I didn't hear that. I heard he, he did said, say that. He yes. said yeah. he said he wouldn't pardon him. But he also said commute. He well, then he's come back and said that because originally okay. he said exactly. he wouldn't answer yeah. the commute yeah. part. But I, I agree with Joe. Let's see how things play out if he loses because I think he'll do one or the other. I really don't see um, I really don't see Hunter Biden doing any jail time. Um, on, on the flip side to your question, would Donald Trump pardon or commute the sentence if his son were convicted of the same or, or similar crime? Absolutely he would. Uh, in, in a heartbeat. Yeah. And, and he probably announced it ahead of time. Yeah, go ahead, do whatever you got to do. I'm going to pardon him anyway. And and that's just his attitude and people would be okay with it. Well, well, the right would be okay with it. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I'm not so sure the prosecutor would be okay with it. Oh. <laughs> I'm just telling you, that's who that's who he is. William? Yeah, I think uh, the key is going to be after the election. I uh, disagree a little bit with Joe. I think after the election, there is a greater possibility that Biden, Hunter Biden would be pardoned. I don't think he will be before the election, but regardless of if Biden wins or loses, I would be a little surprised if he does not uh, either commute or pardon son, his son. Mr. Gilstrap? I'll take the president at his word. I don't think that he'll pardon him. <clears throat> I don't think that anybody should do jail time for a crime like this. I mean, it's, it's just a paper crime. Um, if there are people in jail for this now, they should be freed. And I think, paradoxically, um, Hunter may very well be uh, covered for by current uh, lit uh, litigation that's being put forward by the NRA that is trying to decriminalize this, this kind of... Um, paperwork violation that really should not be a felony to begin with. So that, that would be kind of interesting. So I don't think that there's jail time in the future for Hunter one way or the other. If he, if he is jailed, you know, I, like I said, I, I would take the, the president's word, say that he will neither uh, pardon nor commute. As to whether or not <laughs> uh, Trump would do it, you know, those hy hypotheticals are, are just, they're just, just that. I mean, who knows? It asked me if I would. If I were elected president and it were my son that were convicted of a paperwork thing like that, absolutely, by God, I would. Yeah. And there, but there's a more serious charge coming down. In California. Oh, I think yeah. that's that's no, that could be yeah. life changing for yeah. the young man. Yeah. Or the, I mean, it's, he's not all that young. Yeah, the tax stuff that's coming yeah. down. Yeah. Uh, I think yeah. that's that's a much more serious thing. But this gun thing, I think, is just it's just a, a piffle. There's not a big deal. A piffle. John Gilchrist. What does piffle mean? <laughs> Yeah, John Gilstrap, excellent point, by the way. Uh, this case is going to be tied up, I believe, in appeals for the next year and a half, at least, because the NRA is – they've been gunning, uh, no pun intended, for this law for quite a while. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, the initial report is, hey, he, he bought a firearm while he was on crack. Uh, I mean, even Art Tom said that, that's crazy. But – uh, the NRA is going to uh, step up here and 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 say, look, you know, the, the term addicted, which is what the law prescribes, you know, you shouldn't buy a firearm when you're addicted to uh, some kind of uh, illegal substance. What what does that mean? Uh, do you need a, a, a doctor to sign off on that, that you're addicted? Or, you know, what is a state of mind? Uh, it's such a vague concept that the NRA is going to go after that law. And the irony here is going to be that the NRA is going to be, at least in terms of amicus, if not a front and center party on this one, is going to be filing a part of an appeal over the enforcement of this law. And uh, Hunter Biden is potentially going to have the NRA in his corner on an appeal of this conviction. So uh, that's, I believe, going to be tied up in the courts for quite a while. The NRA is going to want to get that to the U.S. Supreme Court. And uh, we might not know whether Hunter Biden ever has to serve a sentence 
for at least another year and a half. And isn't there a tranche of decisions coming down from the Supremes this month that deals with the regulatory sanctions, the, the, the sanctions that come vi via regulation as opposed to from the Congress? I think it's tied within EPA regulations as opposed to ATF, but it would sort of fall into the same category. Oh, there, oh, there are. In, in fact, uh, the Mifepristone uh, decision yesterday I had to do with the FDA's uh, ability to be the final word on whether a drug is, is useful and safe. Uh, and, and at least, and it was a technicality, I believe, in this decision on Mifepristone with the finding that the uh, petitioner in the case did not really have standing. They, they weren't you know, harmed by uh, what the FDA decision-making process was all about with regard to that drug. Uh, but you're right. There are other decisions coming down, EPA and other governmental agencies, whether they have uh, uh, the authority, legal authority to do the things they do uh, apart from Congress. And uh, we're going to see some decisions on that here probably any day. Larry Schultz. It's fascinating uh, to think about the NRA um, filing an amicus brief uh, on behalf of Hunter Biden. I, I do <laughs> think his if his dad loses the election, you know, he is... The, the the conviction will not be final by that time, as Joe was saying. These these appeals are going to take forever. Um, it fascinates me that Joe Biden, uh, when he took office, this um, prosecutor had been appointed by Donald Trump. He had every right, as he does with every U.S. attorney, uh, to replace him. He didn't do it. Um, he's standing by the rule of law. And... Um, it's fascinating to see these two cases come down, the Trump case and this case, at exactly the same time or roughly the same time, and to see the reactions. Didn't Merrick Garland, I forget the prosecutor's name, but they, they went forward with, that, with the plea bargain that got shot down because it was, it was too wide. And wasn't it, then Merrick Garland elevated him to special prosecutor status, yes. the same guy, right? Yes. So it wasn't, yeah. it, was, it was a Trump appointee to, to uh, U.S. attorney or AUSA. Right. But it was Biden who appointed him as special prosecutor. I thought, no, I thought uh, Trump appointed him as special, special prosecutor. And no, I, it couldn't no, have been. I think he was the, the case not, is not he, that old. When, when Biden took office, this guy was already the U.S. attorney for Delaware or the uh, whatever way they do it yeah. there and so uh i don't think that he became a special prosecutor until merrick garland right. uh ordered him to be right. one um, you know you bring up the it, NRA to provide thing. more protection for him which obviously wasn't needed <laughs> you bring up the nra thing and how it's interesting that they're standing behind hunter biden i think it, it proves the integrity behind the nra mm -hmm. that, that it doesn't matter politics doesn't matter to them it's a, it's about the the law and how it pertains to guns for the NRA, and I wish the ACLU would take the same stance on on some of their issues when when it's a a conservative right wing person um, that has their their rights violated, and and the ACLU stays silent. On to issue number five, and for that, Mr. John Gilstrap. <clears throat> um, all of mine are very dark, so I'm trying to figure out which. Now you know what I'll go with. I'll go with a later one. Um, you know, we all have to make a living, and um, the Elon Musk is negotiating, or the, the the shareholders of Tesla are deciding whether or not Elon Musk should be able to walk away with his forty six billion dollar um, pay package. Was, John, I think they approved it this morning at uh, 45, uh, 44 point nine billion. Okay, then I'll move Ooh, on to a different it. one rather than do, <laughs> that seems like a silly thing to talk about. Okay, um, and I, all right, I, this is a bad segue. I should not have done this with 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 humor. Um, the tragedy of Kennedy Miller has uh, drawn a lot, a lot of negative attention to um, homeschooling. It seems that the uh, she was found. I guess we all know the details or some of the details. She was found in an emaciated state and uh, and passed away and it was in, in a neglectful state for quite some time, hadn't been checked on I think since 2020 or 2021. And this this terrible situation has been laid at the feet of the homeschooling 
uh, process in in West Virginia, and the governor's office had a press conference as as such, and now there's a push to re-examine how we go about um, checking up on homeschooling, and it seems to me that this is given a lot of what's been going on within the education system, and we look at CPS issues and all of this. It seems to me that we're focusing on the wrong thing here. That this is not a homeschooling issue. There's a lot of people who are homeschooled and they do very well. Um, I think Matt Miller just posted his I don't know, multiple kids have been homeschooled in his house and everything has done very well. So is this a rope a dope? Are we is the the focus laying Kennedy Miller's the tragedy of Kennedy Miller's passing laying that at the feet of homeschooling issues? Is that just a, a a misassignment of of this tragedy should we be looking someplace else joe ferretti if i'm a homeschooler and, and I, I believe in that by the way this and i think this whole debate john misses the point if i'm a homeschooler i would want there to be an examination of any aspect of that program or policy being a part of kennedy miller's death uh, because I would want to improve it to the point where it's beyond any question. I, I just think homeschoolers should be all for an examination of, uh, as Senator Blair said, some cracks in the system. Not only was there a failure to file a report, an academic report, for this homeschooled child with the the, the uh, county board of ed and the, and the uh, school superintendents, uh, there was evidence that other school systems and other boards of education are not getting these reports about kids being homeschooled. And, and to me, if I'm a homeschooler, I would want to make sure that's cleaned up so that we don't have this overall debate about whether we should allow homeschooling or not. I don't think a vast majority of people don't want to even go there. I don't think that's the question. The question is, do we have some failures in that system that just need to be cleaned up? Do we have the resources necessary so that these reports did, do get filed so that we have some assurance that these children that are being homeschooled are making appropriate academic progress? That's all that it is. And in the Kennedy Miller's case, it's just a question of you know, was there a missed opportunity to perhaps get more insight as to what was going on with this child in that home? That's all. So I think the question is, is more narrow. I don't think it's a debate about homeschooling at all. And I don't think most people want to have that debate. I think we're all accepting of that. I think the point is just make sure that everybody's doing what they're supposed to be doing and that the law is being followed about these reports. Let's go to Delegate Mike Hyde, who has some experience with the DHS uh, committees. Yeah, I don't think this is uh, an education thing at all. I mean, it's not the job of the school system, whether it's public or private or, or homeschool or whatever. It's it's not not their job to um, check on the welfare of, of children within our state. It's to educate children within our state. There is the whole homeschool thing was this this there were issues within this family to begin with, and because of the issues, the child was pulled out of the public school and homeschooled so i see this as a, a failure of cps to see that hey maybe this is why they're being homeschooled now and we need to do more regular checks on this particular incident this particular child because of of the previous incidents but it's certainly not the job of the education system it's not the job of the public school system to be checking on the welfare of children what happens if they've never been in the public school system they've always been homeschooled are, are we supposed to be sending the is the board of education for berkeley county supposed to be checking on every child that's being homeschooled and making sure that that they're not being mistreated this is this is a failure of people people that were with charged with the responsibility of taking care of this child and failed these these are are horrible human beings cps knew that the these people were were bad and and 
that was the reason that they were taken out of public school. CPS should have been following up on a more regular basis with this particular individual, but it has nothing to do with the education system or homeschooling at all. Larry Schultz. Yeah, well, if, if you're a second grade teacher and one of your students comes in uh, and over time you notice that student is losing weight, losing energy, um, showing other signs of, of sort of a physical problem or a physical distress, it certainly is the duty of that teacher uh, to at least make a report about it. It's not their duty to investigate it, but it is their duty to make a report. If the homeschool uh, student isn't reporting to the schools, then the schools have a duty to reach out to CPS and say, we're not getting reports. That, that, you know, this kid dropped out of these, uh, this school, who knows exactly why, but now we're not getting any reports about this child's education. Could you please check on her? It's not so much that you're putting on the Board of Education the duty to do the investigation, but they are the, um, they are the first warning because there's responsible adults seeing that child every day in a public school or not even getting a report that says any education's going on at all. At some point, the educators do have a duty to follow up when they don't get these reports. It is ultimately the job of CPS, and we've talked many times about how CPS hasn't got enough workers and they're, they can't fill their um, quota of, of, um, of CPS workers uh, to, on the payroll. And so th there's always going to be an excuse there of, hey, we just don't have the people or we didn't get the information. So, so I see it more as a joint responsibility, more notice on the part of the schools and action on the part of CPS. But both of them failed terribly here. Mr. Stubblefield, you yeah. have a minute, I think. We live in a community of tribes. This is another example. One tribe is throwing stones. The other tribe is circling the wagons. Have we lost the capability of having an objective study to look across the boundaries of the tribe without the perception that we're picking on one tribe at the expense of the other? Which seems to be the reaction from the homeschooling community, and we spoke with uh, Roy Ramey yesterday, who was obviously very offended that this was, he perceived being laid at the feet of the homeschooling community, and the final word goes back to you, Mr. Gilstrap. I think there's always danger in extrapolating out from one tragedy to assume that this is a bigger issue uh, than, than perhaps it is. We all know that CPS has, has big issues. We all know that the education system has big issues. Um, to assume, and in this case, there was a truancy problem too. They were not making the education reports that they should have. But there are established programs within homeschooling, as I understand it was described yesterday, that parents are supposed to report in on a regular basis about academic performance. So if those, if those milestones are being met, I think there's a presumption of health and happiness on the part of the homeschool child. And I, I think to have regular CPS visits on an otherwise healthy and happy home is just intrusive. So, um, but th this, I think that there is an issue with, I say,